Welcome to a live BYU devotional broadcast. Today, Christopher Matson of BYU's Department of Mechanical Engineering will address the campus community. The devotional originates from the Marriott Center on the BYU campus. Brothers and sisters, and welcome to this morning's devotional. I am Keith Forking, the Advancement Vice President, and I will be conducting today. We are pleased to have Christopher A. Matson, Professor of Mechanical Engineering, as our speaker today. We, expand, we extend a special welcome to his wife, Melissa, and their family members and friends who are here. Please join us next Tuesday at this same time and place for a campus forum. We will have the opportunity of hearing from Carl L. Hansen, Professor of Public Health in the College of Life Sciences. We hope you will join us. This morning's prelude was provided by Landon Finch, a junior majoring in organ performance from Elk Ridge, Utah. Kobe Hagen, a senior studying choral music education from Kansas City, Missouri, led us in singing the opening hymn. The invocation this morning will be offered by Brian Stringham a doctoral student of mechanical engineering from Garden City, Utah. Immediately following the opening prayer, Molly Smith, a sophomore majoring in music from South Jordan, Utah, will perform a piano solo medley entitled, I'm Trying to Be Like Jesus and Will Bring the World His Truth. Now the prayer by Brother Stringham. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this opportunity that we have to be gathered for this devotional today. We are grateful for this university and for the opportunities that it has provided us and for the sacrifices of all those that have uh, made it what it is today. We are grateful to have a living prophet on the earth today and please bless and strengthen and uphold him and help us to heed his counsel. We are grateful for, most of all for our Savior Jesus Christ. And we're grateful for the strength and peace that comes as we strive to follow him through these challenging times and through the uh, global and personal challenges that we face. Please help us to always remember who we are and that we are thy sons and daughters. And help us to be better disciples of Jesus Christ. Help us to uphold the truths of the restored gospel and help us to seek after those things that matter most. At this time, we ask a special blessing upon Dr. Matson that he will be blessed with thy spirit as he shares his thoughts with us today. Please bless him for the time that he has taken and the sacrifices he has made to do this, and please bless us that our hearts may be softened and receptive to the truths that thou would have us receive. We love thee very much and are grateful for our many blessings and say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you, Sister Smith, for that uh, beautiful and inspiring music setting the table for our devotional this morning. As I'd mentioned, Christopher A. Matson is a BYU professor of mechanical engineering. Previously, he was a Fulbright Scholar and Global Director of Engineering Design and Research at ATL Technology. Dr. Madsen earned a bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering from BYU. And he received a doctorate in mechanical engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Professor Madsen has been awarded multiple U.S. patents for his innovations. And not surprisingly, in his free time, he enjoys building things and being creative. Brother Matson and his wife, Melissa, are the parents of four children. Following Brother Matson's remarks, the benediction will be offered by Miriam Bush, an academic advisor in mechanical engineering. And now we'll be pleased to hear from Brother Christopher A. Matson. Before I begin, I'd just like to say thank you to Sister Molly Smith for the beautiful music. I love both of those songs that she put into a beautiful medley. And many times in my life, those songs have given me strength, including today. Like Nephi, I too was born of goodly parents, but I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. From an early age, I was surrounded by innovation and encouraged to be creative by my shop teacher father and my interior designer mother. Both as a professor of engineering and in my personal life, I am happiest when I'm creating. For example, I enjoy woodworking, welding, leatherwork, 3D printing, and home renovation. I regularly practice technical sketching, 3D CAD modeling, graphic design, and writing. At the end of a long day, it's not uncommon for me to play the guitar just to wind down. Although I am rarely, if ever, content trying to copy someone else's creative work, like making a replica of a movie prop, for example, I'm very interested in learning about and emulating the creative process that others have successfully used. I like studying about influential designers and iconic products, ultimately trying to discover their history and understand the reasons for their success. These stories and their underlying principles often show up in my teaching at BYU. For example, I've taught about or written about influential people ranging from product designer Dieter Rams, to photographer Ansel Adams, to video game designer Shigeru Miyamoto, and about products including the Lego Brick, WD-40, and the Fender Precision Base. Successful people and products from the past are inspiring to me, and what I learned from their stories often permeates what I do, including this talk, as you'll see shortly. I feel blessed to teach and do research on the engineering design process, product development, and interdisciplinary design work. I'm particularly grateful to have team taught design and innovation with inspiring faculty from six colleges and various departments at BYU. I visited roughly 50 countries, almost all of them to collaborate on creative endeavors. These experiences and others have taught me how valuable and different each perspective is, and that it takes all kinds of people, interests and backgrounds and ideas to make the world as beautiful as it is. So it's an understatement to say that being surrounded by innovation early in my life has influenced who I am as an adult. Thank you, Mom and Dad, for giving me the gift of creativity. My parents joined the church when I was a toddler, so while I was surrounded by innovation from an early age, I was simultaneously surrounded by the love that comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ. As much as I value my early exposure to creativity, I consider my parents' conversion to the gospel to be the greatest of all the gifts they gave me. They shared their conversion with me by teaching me what they discovered while they studied the gospel. I remember one time in particular when my mom called me into where she was studying and shared with me the story of the Jaredites and their 344-day journey across the open sea. Crossing the sea was difficult for them, she said. They were hit by overwhelming storms and mountainous waves, but their trust in the Lord carried them through. And when they finally made it to shore, they bowed themselves down upon the face of the land and did humble themselves before the Lord. 
and did shed tears of joy before the Lord because of the multitude of his tender mercies over them. After reading that scripture with me, my mom said something that turned this otherwise historical account into a story that has helped shape who I am. She said, the Jaredite journey is an analogy to our lives and the ups and downs we will face as we experience this life. The message is about how to make it through, where to turn for strength, and about recognizing God's blessings, even when things are tough. Over the years, that moment with my mom has helped me put my struggles into context and has helped me trust in the Lord, even when things seem to turn upside down. As the decades have passed and I have thought more deeply about the Jaredite story as a metaphor, it has been impossible for me to ignore two critical parts of the story that stem from my interest in design and innovation. They are the people and the products at the center of that story, namely the brother of Jared and his curious boats. In studying that story even deeper, I've come to realize that a successful Jaredite journey was not as inevitable as it may seem on the surface. Instead, the impact of the Savior's tender mercies over them were only fully enabled by the character of the boat builders and the nature of the boats they chose to construct. In our life's journey, we will face metaphorical storms, even terrible tempests and ferocious winds and mountainous waves. We need to be good boat builders for we need strong boats that can hold up to the storms and get us where we need to go. In this talk, I'll share six ways to be better boat builders. These six ways were derived from the Book of Mormon as I studied the boat building experiences of both the brother of Jared and of Nephi. I am grateful to have studied these six things because I need them right now in my life as I continue to construct and repair my boat and as I occasionally find myself in the middle of unanticipated storms. While useful for me, I believe these six things are even more pertinent to you young university students who are in the throes of constructing the boats that will take you through your adulthood. To that end, I pray for the gift of the Holy Ghost, that it may rest more fully upon you during this devotional, so that you might hear the message that God has for you as you construct your boats even and especially if that message comes to your hearts as opposed to your ears from the words that I say. Okay, even though we've just started, it's time for a small review. In this metaphor, our life is like a journey over the sea. There is a starting point and there is an ending point. Along the way, there are storms, some we can avoid and others that just happen, regardless of what we do. The boat we take this journey in matters, since it will largely determine how we experience the storms. We are the boat builders. We choose and construct which vessel to make the journey in. And now the golden question, what is the boat? The boat represents the vehicle with which we will experience life's journey. To me, this is most easily thought of as our individual character, attitude, resiliency, our priorities, talents, and habits, all of which undergo development while we live our lives. This reminds me of an interesting concept in the field of engineering, design, and creativity. The concept was popularized by Stanford mechanical engineering professor Bernie Roth in his course called Designing Your Life. The basic notion of designing your life is to think deliberately about who you want to become, what it will take to get there, and then take the steps necessary to lead to that life. The core concept of the course is that we have more control over who we become than we think we do. Now, if this concept is true, and for the most part, I believe that it is, I want as much guidance as I can get in designing my life and building my metaphorical boat. And where better to turn for guidance than the enduring accounts in the scriptures? They are time-tested, non-trendy, and powerful, and they are the word of God. And as if we were destined to ask the question, what kind of boat builder should I be? There are multiple detailed descriptions of how the scriptural boat builders did their work and prepared for a successful journey. 
Through study and likening, we can extract from the scriptures six ways to be better boat builders, which I will now share. Number one, to be a better boat builder, let the Lord lead you. Nephi is very clear in saying that he was instructed of the Lord, both when he was first commanded to build the boat and throughout the process while progress was being made. This means Nephi accepted guidance and instruction. He let the Lord lead him. We don't know if it was easy or hard for Nephi to be instructed in this way. Many of us imagine it would have been easy for Nephi. But had I been in Nephi's shoes, I would have been nervous about one particular aspect of the Lord's instructions, that the design of the boat and the construction techniques were not after the manner of men. I would have wanted to stick to proven technologies, the ones I had seen others use. Nephi's statements about the uniqueness of what he was asked to do suggest that he had a knowledge of how boats were designed and built in his time, and that what he was asked to do was different. How willing are we to follow the Lord's instructions when constructing our boats? And how much more difficult does it become when we know that what he has asked us to do is not after the manner of men? We know that some of Nephi's brothers tried hard to discourage him from doing to the work, adding to the pressure to give up. Mocking Nephi, they said, we knew that ye could not construct a ship, for we knew that ye were lacking in judgment. Wherefore thou canst accomplish so great a work. As a young member of the church, you have also been called to a great work. Don't let anyone discourage you or discredit you from answering that call and for doing good in the world. Answering it well, however, is hard work that often requires us to collaborate and to rely on each other's strengths. We don't know if Nephi's older brothers were lazy or opposed to the ship project in principle, but we do know that they were desirous that they might not labor. And this made Nephi's job harder. He pleaded with his brothers that they should no more murmur, neither should they withhold their labor from him. As strained as their relationship appears to have been, Nephi needed his brothers to help move the work along. Eventually, the brothers did help and the job was accomplished according to the instructions of the Lord. And in the end, it was done so well that the workmanship was described as being exceedingly fine. Number two, to be a better boat builder, use tools to amplify your strength. One of the beautiful parts of Nephi's construction story is that when asked to build the boat, he was proactive and immediately asked the Lord, whither shall I, shall I go that I might find ore to molten, that I may make tools to construct the ship after the manner that thou hast shown me. Nephi's proactive nature, which, which is a reflection of his character, and his faith in the Lord's ability to show him where to find ore, which is a reflection of his spirituality, are the typical highlights of this story. But there is another part of this interaction that I find equally inspiring. And it is that Nephi knew that to accomplish the work, he would need to couple together his faith and his physical strength. And importantly, he knew that his own physical strength could be amplified with tools, which most certainly came in the form of simple machines, namely wedges, levers, wheels, and so on. In this way, Nephi brought more than his best self to the task. In our worldwide church, we are so blessed to have at our disposal so many tools, the scriptures, the living prophets, general conference, numerous church publications, temple work, missionary service, the church educational system, and many more. Every one of those tools is designed to help us build our boats and successfully take our journey. Just like Nephi, we need to be proactive in the construction of our boats. We need to be faithful in following the Lord. And we need to use the tools we've been given to amplify our natural abilities and to help us contribute in deeper, more meaningful ways than we could without them. Number three, to be a better boat builder, seek appropriate balance. Building our metaphorical boats is exhausting. I know this firsthand. I commonly commit to too much and find myself running faster than I have strength. 
And this is not good, by the way. Sometimes it's so tiring that I find myself pausing from my boat's construction, taking a break from my personal development. Made manifest by your commitment to higher education, the intellectual parts of your boat are as strong as ever. You are building, building, building. Way to go. But are you keeping enough in reserve to keep going on the other parts in your boat? For example, the spiritual parts. Now, it's not necessary to be equally balanced in all things in life. But in pursuit of your academic goals, it is important to not neglect your physical health, your mental and emotional health, nor your spiritual health. To keep the boat upright, you don't need perfect balance, but neglect one entire category and your chances of capsizing are greater. I love the scriptures describing what happened to the brother of Jared when things became imbalanced in his life. While in the middle of tumultuous Old Testament events, the brother of Jared and his people found favor with the Lord and were brought out of harm's way, being led continuously by the hand of the Lord, eventually to the edge of the sea where they set up their tents and stayed for four years. Sometime in the middle of those four years, the brother of Jared stopped praying. And in this way, he had lost his balance. The part of the story that is inspiring to me is how quickly the imbalance could be corrected. And it came to pass at the end of four years that the Lord came again unto the brother of Jared. And for the space of three hours did the Lord talk with the brother of Jared and did chasten him because he had remembered not to call upon the name of the Lord. And the brother of Jared repented. And the Lord said, go to work and build. And the brother of Jared did go to work and also his brethren and built barges according to the instructions of the Lord. Change is always possible. And the change that comes from repentance is complete. So complete that God remembers our sins no more. This was true for the brother of Jared and this is true for us. Later in the brother of Jared's life, well after the three hours of chastisement, the Lord praised the brother of Jared as if he had always been faithful in praying when he said, Never has man come before me with such exceeding faith as thou hast. Number four, to be a better boat builder, ask good questions. There's an interesting sentiment expressed throughout both boat builders' accounts. It is that the Lord did go before them. What this means is that they followed the instructions of the Lord. And I believe this made all the difference in their successful construction and journey. Does this mean they followed blindly? No, it doesn't. The Jaredite story conveys this well. The Lord had instructed the brother of Jared to make barges. And after he was done doing what the Lord had asked, the brother of Jared was concerned with the design. And so he shared his concerns and doubts with the Lord. In our lives too, it is okay to have questions and concerns. We know that Joseph Smith had questions, and his were about religion. He didn't shy away from those questions. He didn't give up on his spirituality because of his questions. He asked his questions. President Russell M. Nelson recently taught us about questioning when he said, if you have questions, and I hope you do, seek answers with the fervent desire to believe. Learn all you can about the gospel and be sure to turn to truth-filled sources for guidance. Joseph turned to the scriptures, to trusted friends, and to family members. But most importantly, he turned to God in humble prayer. After building eight boats as instructed by the Lord, the brother of Jared was worried. He didn't believe the barges would work well as designed. When he shared his concern with the Lord, he received three very different kinds of responses that I believe are all possibilities for how God might help us refine and build our boats. As you know, the Jaredite boats were very unique. They were described as being tight like unto a dish. They were tight on the bottom and on the sides and on the top. Even the door to get in was tight like unto a dish when it was shut. They were so exceedingly tight that in those boats there was no air to breathe nor light to see. These were two of the brother of Jared's concerns. The brother of Jared said, Lord, we will die if we cannot breathe. In response, the Lord said, in essence, put a hole in the top of your boat and put one of those airtight hatches on it. When you need air, open it. If water comes in, close it. So far, this solution sounds reasonable, right? 
But then the Lord said, put a hole in the bottom of your boat with the same airtight hatch on it. Sometimes God gives us an answer to our question. And that answer makes sense to us. And sometimes it doesn't. Often, though, in hindsight, his answers do make sense. I imagine that when the Jaredite boats were tossed and turned during their rough journey, and what was once the top of the boat was now the bottom of the boat, they could see the wisdom of the Lord's instructions. Number five, to be a better boat builder, search for solutions in the scriptures. The brother of Jared also shared concerns with the Lord about the lack of light in the boats. This time, instead of providing a solution, the Lord asked the brother of Jared for a solution. In response, the brother of Jared created 16 clear stones and asked the Lord to touch them and make them shine in the dark. I don't know what kind of solution the Lord was expecting the brother of Jared to have, but I believe it is possible that the Lord wanted the brother of Jared to do exactly what we're doing, likening the scriptures unto us. According to Moroni, who abridged the book of Ether, the Jaredites had a scriptural record which speaks concerning the creation of the world and also of Adam and an account from that time even to the great tower. This would have included some account of Noah, his boat, and the flood. We don't know what details the brother of Jared had about Noah's boat building experience, but in our King James Version of the Bible when reading about Noah, there is an interesting footnote in Genesis chapter 6, verse 16 that says... Some rabbis believed that Noah's window in his ark was a precious stone that shone in the dark. Perhaps the brother of Jared solved the darkness problem by searching the scriptures, finding what was pertinent to him, and putting it into practice. And finally, number six, to be a better boat builder, commend yourself to the Lord. The brother of Jared had three concerns about the boat design. We've already talked about the lack of air and the lack of light problems. The third problem was more complex, deeper, and is least, the least spoken of in the scriptures, but I believe it is the most profound. While examining the boats he had constructed according to the Lord's instructions and feeling uncomfortable with the lack of light and air, the brother of Jared also asked the Lord, whither shall we steer? I believe this verse can be interpreted in two different but equally frightening ways. Lord, where are we going? And Lord, from where in this boat do we do the steering? To solve the lack of air problem, the Lord gave a solution that worked. To solve the lack of light problem, the Lord asked the brother of Jared to find a solution, which he did well. But this third problem was different. Though seemingly fundamental to a cross-ocean journey, the boat's problem with steering would not be fixed. The Lord had a different plan that the brother of Jared had not yet understood. The Lord's plan was for the Jaredites to commend themselves to the Lord or to entrust themselves to the Lord's hands. It would be the Lord who would steer, who would direct, and would see that they completed their journey as intended. No doubt it required significant faith to enter those boats, perhaps without a way to steer, and certainly without a course plotted to a destination. But that is exactly what they did. They got aboard their barges and set forth into the sea, commending themselves unto the Lord their God. And it came to pass that the Lord God caused that there should be a ferocious wind blow upon the face of the waters toward the promised land. And thus they were tossed upon the waves of the sea before the wind. And it came to pass that they were many times buried in the depths of the sea because of the mountain waves which broke upon them and also the terrible tempests which were caused by the fierceness of the winds. And it came to pass that when they were buried in the deep, there was no water that could hurt them, their vessels being tight like unto a dish. Therefore, when they were encompassed about by the many waters, they did cry unto the Lord, and he did bring them forth again upon the top of the waters. And it came to pass that the wind did never cease to blow toward the promised land while they were upon the waters. And thus they were driven forth before the wind. And so we can see by this account that the Jaredites did commend themselves unto the Lord, thus unlocking all of the Savior's tender mercies that saved them. But in so doing, by entrusting themselves unto the Lord, they also passed through some extremely trying times. 
for the very wind, even that ferocious wind that pushed them successfully to their destination, also caused them to be tossed and turned and to have mountainous waves crash heavily upon them. But through it all, their boats held up, both physically and metaphorically. Throughout their journey, they trusted the Lord and did sing praises unto the Lord and did thank and praise the Lord all the day long. And when the night came, they did not cease to praise the Lord. And when their 344-day journey ended, they knelt in prayer and shed tears of joy before the Lord because of the multitude of his tender mercies over them. Now, as we come to the end of this story, let's take a moment to review. The boat we take on life's journey matters since it will largely determine how we experience the storms. We are the boat builders. We choose and construct the vessel to make the journey in. To be a better boat builder, number one, let the Lord lead you in your construction. Number two, amplify your natural abilities by using the tools available to you. Number three, seek for a reasonably well-balanced construction and correct imbalance quickly. Number four, have and ask good questions, seeking answers from truth-filled sources. Number five, search the scriptures for answers and liken them unto you. And finally, number six, trust in the Lord and commend yourself to his perfect care. Thank you, Mom, and thank you, Dad, for finding and sharing these stories with me. I believe them. I find strength in them. And they've shaped the way I want to live. Though I fall short more often than I would like, I know in whom I have trusted. And I know to whom I will turn for tender mercies. And though the ferocious winds and mountainous waves and terrible tempests come, as they do for all of us in our lives, our boats can be made to handle it just fine if we choose to let the Lord lead out on the design. His design is made for survival, and he has said, for ye cannot cross this great deep, save I prepare you against the waves of the sea and the winds which have gone forth and the floods which shall come. It is my prayer that we may all have the foresight, faith, and courage to let the Savior be the author and finisher of our story. And to let him be the master architect and a cherished partner in the construction of our boats. And that we may all enjoy the fruits of a successful journey together. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Our kind Father in heaven, in these tumultuous times, we are so grateful for the gospel of Jesus Christ and the strength and hope that it gives us. We are especially grateful for a prophet to lead and guide us. Today we are grateful for this inspiring talk. And we pray as we go forward that we will remember who we are as thy children, as thy covenant people, and as we strive to build our lives, that we will look to thee, that we will be guided by thy hand, that we will be strengthened to face the fierce winds in our lives, that we will take the Savior to be our, our captain. And we ask thee to bless us to remember who we are, in connection with this great university that we will remember and represent it well wherever we go. We say these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thee our thanks and love. Amen. Amen. This has been a live broadcast of a BYU campus devotional. The address today was given by Christopher Matson of BYU's Department of Mechanical Engineering. Find links to the full text, audio, and video of this address within the week at speeches.byu.edu. 
Don't miss next week's live forum address at this same time with Carl Hansen of BYU's Department of Public Health. And tune in to BYU Radio tomorrow and every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific for Finding Center, an hour of spiritual focus on what matters most. BYU Devotionals are a production of BYU Broadcasting.